Well, welcome, folks, to this first in the fifth of our series in the uh, Abundant Living series. And uh, this is, uh, in fact, the second recording of this first class uh, in as much as the first recording uh, crashed a couple times. And uh, so there were some interruptions, and in fact, only the first 20 minutes apparently ended up being recorded. So I'm re-recording this class now, and uh, in that light, uh, there will be, uh, uh, I should say, there won't be the uh, attendees live in this recording, so it will not have necessarily the interactive element uh, of the original recording or the original class. Uh, however, uh, in interest of the quality of this recording and of getting all of the material in, we're doing this uh, a second time over. So, thank you for attending, and um, we're now going to dive into the material, taking a moment uh, to settle in, uh, as we really are going to be covering some pretty deep topics here, broad-reaching, wide-ranging topics here that get down to some very fundamental core issues uh, for us on the planet at this time. So I'll invite you all to take a moment just to settle in for this recording. Uh, connecting with your breath is a wonderful way to bring our attention into the present moment. At the same time, just letting go as we breathe out of the stresses and tensions and uh, the busyness of the day allowing ourselves this time to really absorb and understand and appreciate uh, what is being offered here and to also make it uh, real for ourselves by uh, uh, offering our willingness to practice some of these things and to follow through on some of these ideas on a practical level. Of course, you will all have been provided uh, the charts that we'll be discussing tonight, and you also have the outline of the notes as well uh, included with your subscription. So I suggest that you have those handy and available as well as you go through this recording. So we're talking about an energy in essence described as the wounded male archetype. And so of course, we need to understand what that means. And, give a definition to this rather uh, arcane uh, concept. And uh, we're also going to look at the origin, the history of this energy pattern, we'll call it at this point. Uh, where did it come from? How did it show up? And, and why is it such a pervasive influence uh, still today on the planet? How is it showing up for us individually? How, how are we being affected in our individual lives? by this energy pattern, and of course, how is it affecting humanity collectively, which it has been doing quite significantly for a long time. What are the different traits and indications of the wounded male archetype? And of course, we have a chart now to help us break some of these issues down and to identify them and clear them for ourselves as well. And that brings us to what do we do about this? How do we heal the wounded male archetype? Uh, because really, uh, from the perspective of spirit, from the perspective of non-duality, all bad behavior, whether it's on the part of an individual or on the part of a collective thought entity, such as this wounded male archetype, is in fact a call for love. It is simply a, uh, an expression of, of the lack of love and uh, doing the very best it can to bring to our attention the need for love. And that is the most constructive way to look at any kind of uh, issue or aberration that we may have judged in the past as being wrong or, or bad or anything like that. So we're, we're not coming from that perspective. We are coming from the perspective of healers and, and hoping and wishing to bring a healing energy to all that we uh, perceive and all that spirit sends our way. We'll also be talking about the great shift of the ages, which is the time period we're in now, which uh, also represents a, a tremendous healing opportunity around this whole energy of the wounded male archetype. And we'll be looking at some of the dynamics of this shift and also some of the things that we can be aware of to assist ourselves and our loved ones and clients move through this time, which can be framed in terms of 
the healing of the wounded male archetype and again returning to the memory of and the balancing of the divine feminine. So first of all, let's uh, investigate what we mean by an archetype to begin with. The uh, definition from dictionary.com is simply the original pattern or model from which all things of the same kind are copied or on which they are based, a model or first form, like a prototype. In Jungian psychology, it is said that an archetype is a collectively inherited unconscious idea or pattern of thought, image, etc., universally present in individual psyches. So it's another way of saying a, a collective thought form. The psychologist Carl Jung believed that universal mythic characters or archetypes reside within the collective unconscious of people the world over. Archetypes represent fundamental human motifs of our experience as we evolved. Consequently, they evoke deep emotions. So again, we're talking about a collective image or sense of a, of a being, you might say, that has been supported generationally on the planet through the beliefs and behaviors of, of many, many people. And so, in a sense, it takes on a life of its own. A collective thought form would operate in the fourth dimension or astral plane, which is also refer, referred to as the mental plane. But it's a collective form or energy that takes on uh, a life of its own, being fed by so many people's consciousness and so many people's attention. It's kind of like Santa Claus. You know, if you get enough people thinking about and believing in Santa Claus, in all likelihood, there is an essence or a being of Santa Claus somewhere uh, in, that, in the etheric realms that we have made out of our projections, out of our collective beliefs. So it's a fine line as to whether or not to say the wounded male archetype is a being or simply, uh, again, a coagulation or an accumulation of collective thought forms. And I suppose in the long run it doesn't really matter because what we're talking about is healing this energy which, if it's coming from the mind, uh, obviously infers healing of the mind. And this, again, loops right back to our definition of healing, which always occurs on the level of mind, and why we call this practice mind field repatterning. Identifying the patterns that we are holding in our minds, collectively, individually, and if they're not working for us, or if they're based in fear or guilt or projection, changing our minds. You know, the same power of the mind that we have employed over eons to create these archetypes can just as easily change its mind. Uh, and that is the great promise of this time. As the Mayans predicted, we would become, post-2012, conscious co-creators of realities. So we have been co-creating many realities on this planet, but not necessarily from a conscious place rather doing so automatically or without much thought or awareness. Well, all of that's changing now, and hopefully this class is part of uh, the providing of that awareness so that we are aware of what we can change and aware of our power to look at things differently. So more specifically, what is this wounded male archetype we're talking about? Well, let's look at the duality of uh, of the universe. Duality simply means the coexistence of opposites. And before the universe was made, uh, there was no such thing as duality as everything that was, is, and could be was in a perfect state of oneness. Duality began with the creation of the universe and our belief as participants in that process that something could separate from wholeness, that there could be an opposite to wholeness. And this was the beginning of duality and what A Course in Miracles calls the split in the mind, where the part of the mind aware of wholeness and oneness was denied and our experience of the universe of separation took up all of our attention. That doesn't mean that oneness went away, it just went away in our awareness as we turned our attention to the universe of separation and duality. One of the basic splits or dichotomies expressed in this dualistic universe is the separation between yang and yin energy. Now these are Eastern um, uh, principles and Eastern medicine in 
which is rooted in this in the sense of non-duality recognize in the pattern of nature two basic forces the yang force or the male energy uh, poetically described as the sunny side of the mountain where life is expressing things are moving um, energy is being put forward into growth and expansion that's all very yang energy whereas the yin energy the yin side of the duality was poetically described as the shady side of the mountain where there was rest where there was uh, containment where there was a holding pattern where there was nurturance uh, and some of these more yin or feminine qualities so yang is about expression it's the energy of movement change exploration penetration including uh, analysis and mental engagement innovation invention these are all very yang expressions uh yang being in a balanced and harmonized state with yin yin again representing the energy of receptivity of stillness the creation of life and the nurturance of life which we of course associate with the feminine however when yang is out of balance as in for example the wounded male archetype we find that yang energy being pushed to the extreme and manifesting as aggression anger competition forcefulness willfulness right polarized consciousness this idea of wrong and right us and them the good guys and the bad guys <laughs> disrespect of nature and feminine values as an outcome of this imbalance so on a psychic level mental or, or energetic level this imbalance in the yang also implies fear and suspicion of the other you know projecting our fears onto an imaginary source outside of ourselves for example judgment opinionation uh, inflexibility uh, ego identification and materially oriented these are all general indications on a psychic level of what the wounded male archetype entails so I think you can begin to see that a lot of the problems in our society and in our world today really can be traced back uh, on some level to this imbalance in the yang energy so just to put this in context for ourselves on the balance chart now the balance chart you might recall from earlier classes and it's really part of our basic training uh, looks like this and uh, the balance chart is one of the basic fundamental measurement charts we use in measuring different qualities in this case if you can imagine this chart uh, laying out in front of you flat or if you want to quickly draw it for yourself or simply fan out your left hand for your right handers and use your hand chart uh, in a similar fashion if you're using your back of your hand with your fingers fanned out then the zero position would be held by the middle finger and over towards your thumb would be the positive side or yang side and on the minus side would be the inside so with your pendulum in the center point there uh, at the bottom simply ask to be shown where is my overall energetic orientation in this moment between yang on the right and yin on the left now if you are balanced overall balanced in yin and yang then your pendulum is going to go right down the center to zero but if you've got excess yang energy it's going to go over to the right and each one of those numbers you can interpret as a percentage if you like 10 20 percent 30 percent uh, and of course the further over to the right the more imbalanced in the yang you might find yourself and the same with over on the left uh, indicating an energy of yin in our um, classes and in the dowsing 101 materials we actually lead uh, students through uh, a, an organ investigation uh, using this particular chart checking the yin and the yang balance for for the major organs and systems of the body and then correcting them so if you are uh, overall excess yang to the right you would then correct that energy with a left spin of your pendulum to bring the energy down to the balance point to zero if you are over on the left however imbalanced in the yin then you would raise that energy being as a negative energy you would raise that energy with the right spin to bring yourself back up to zero now obviously this is a very general kind of sweeping approach 
and we're not really going into the specifics at this point as to why I might be yin or white too much yin or too much yang, uh, but just to get an idea of how this can work and also how you can balance the energies, whether they're on either side of that balance point. So again, check for yourself, where am I in the overall, my overall relationship with yin and yang energies, and then simply adjust those energies. If you are extremely one way or the other, you may want to revisit this chart a few days in a row and adjust that energy back to zero until it actually sticks, which does happen uh, with this type of sort of surface uh, correction. If you correct that issue enough energetically, it's like your body, your energy field kind of gets the message, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be, and sooner or later it will entrain to that balance point. But again, this is a very general sort of an, an overview look of our energy. So let's look at the history of the wounded male archetype. It wasn't always part of uh, the planetary experience. Uh, in a sense, it's relatively new, although we can trace the, the deepest origins of this to the arrival of the Anunnaki culture, uh, a scientifically advanced humanoid culture that Zacharias Sitchin wrote about in the book The Twelfth Planet, published in 1976. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Uh, there's all kinds of information available, and if you haven't read the book, well, you may want to do so. It reads uh, like a very scholarly, academic uh, work, um, analyzing ancient uh, language of the Sumerians and their story of uh, the origins of humanity, uh, of modern humans, uh, as an upgrade, actually, by these advanced ETs. Uh, back in the day when they came to Earth looking for gold and they needed slave labor. So basically, uh, the Anunnaki upgraded uh, primitive hominid type beings to modern human status for their own purpose. But the important part is that this race of beings, known as the Anunnaki, represented a top-down male-dominant hierarchy. They were ruled by a male king, uh, or ruler named Anu, and Anu apparently didn't even want to come down to the surface of the earth. He stayed in the comforts of his of his craft while he sent his two sons, uh, Enki and Enlil, to actually uh, you know do the work of um, well basically robbing the planet of its resources. The Anunnaki uh, established the pattern of uh, colonization which their human uh, ancestors learned very well and uh, is the same energy pattern behind the um, more modern colonization of most of the world by the European colonizing uh, nations. In other words, the colonial powers, Great Britain, Holland, Portugal, Spain, and all of that, were really just uh, acting out and following the example of our, you might say, um, evolutionary parents and the leadership established by them at that time. More recently, however, and uh, again, in cosmological terms, we're talking about 6,000 years ago, uh, according to some researchers whom uh, I have found to trust their information, there was a, a, an incursion of another negative ET influence from Orion. And I believe that these uh, beings, this species, were uh, represent the negative uh, lizard species, or Draco, that David Icke goes to great lengths of describing in his work. And when they came in, they introduced uh, a whole new level of control from the top down with what we call the Babylonian money magic system. These beings from Orion were the ones who imprinted civilization with the idea of controlling populations through debt, largely through debt. So social control through debt slavery and all that that involves, uh, the kinds of economies that, um, that flourish in the debt slavery type of a situation are the same cultures that are responsible for wars, poverty, inequality, uh, as well as dualistic religions. So in other words, what we see today in the world, we, we're still living in the shadow of the British Empire, 
uh, which in fact never really went away. Uh, they just changed their name, and uh, instead of conquering countries, they just incorporated them. Uh, so we have colonialism, we have predatory capitalism. Capitalism that goes into countries, for example, and provides all kinds of loans for development, but it turns out that the development doesn't really benefit the country or the people of the country. It benefits the corporations and the rich colonial powers, and thus uh, enslaving those, these populations and these countries, well over 40 of them around the world since World War II, uh, enslaving them into the global system of, again, um, debt slavery. So we're still living in the shadow of these energies, and we're actually living in the uh, tail end of them. We're, we're seeing the, the inevitable implosion of these systems. But again, we're living out patterns that have been long established on the planet now, and basically all involve this male energy out of balance. So here we have, uh, again, depictions of the two uh, factions of uh, demigods, we'll call them, who were part of the establishment of the idea of a dualistic god. So if you look at uh, particularly the Judeo-Christian tradition, as well as the Quran and, and uh, what we call the Abrahamic uh, religions, which include Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, they all subscribe to the same book, uh, at least up until the time of Abraham. And in that book, what we call the Bible, we have a very conflicted view of God, which they, uh, again, recorded as a single being. So on one page, you have a God who is very benevolent and loving and creates all kinds of wonderful things for his children. And then on the next page, uh, he's instructing them to slaughter their neighbors and to crucify and, and burn the crops and all kinds of evil stuff very schizophrenic. Well, the idea of these two sides, uh, of these two demigods would help to explain that schizophrenic nature of the god of these of these Abrahamic religions. They're actually describing both Enki and Enlil, Enlil but mistaking them as a single being. So, uh, again, we're still living in the shadow of the influence of these uh, very uh, important cultures in our history. So what is it costing us today? What is the wounded male archetype costing us uh, in its continued dominance on the world scene? Well, just as an example, the United States federal government has spent or obligated $4.8 trillion on the wars in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. That, that's just recently, folks. And the thing about that is that the money invested in war yields no return. What are the returns on war, war dollars? Well, injured, uh, injured soldiers, uh, soldiers who are damaged psychically, emotionally, uh, committing suicide. We have families uh, around the world whose homes have been destroyed. And this is what's responsible, of course, for the uh, uh, incursion of migrants now all throughout Europe. If, if their homes weren't blown up and their relatives weren't murdered, then they wouldn't be seeking uh, asylum outside of their own country. So the cost is is tremendous, and uh, it's a sad thing when we take it for granted that this is the nature of of our world. Well, it's our nature, the nature of our world under the spell of the wounded male archetype. We have in environmental destructions, uh, landmines left over still from World War II. People are still stepping on and and being maimed. Uh, the the death and wounded around the world, orphans and displaced uh, citizens of these countries that are being bombed into oblivion, simply creating more terrorists in the future, uh, and again, ensuring this kind of deadly cycle of war boom bust. Uh, and then we have a world population kept in low frequency energy through fear and media manipulation. Just like uh, George Orwell predicted in his novel 1984, when he predicted back then that the world would be uh, subject to a global um, entity that divided itself into three factions to ensure that war be a continual uh, problem on the earth. 
and would be used continuously pro for propaganda purposes in keeping the population uh, in fear and, uh, and uh, in competition. So all of this uh, can also boil down in one perspective to simply the attempt to divide populations to prevent the inevitable emergence of oneness or the ascension process. So there's, there's one entity really that is hell-bent on preventing our planetary awakening, and that is simply the collective ego. So the wounded male archetype is really just, you know, a face of the ego that is completely out of balance in the male energy. And it's only the ego that is threatened by our oneness, because the ego is the belief that we're separate. And it is a program that we programmed. So uh, obviously we did a great job, and the ego is programmed to survive at all costs, even at the survival of the human race. So again, we there's no doubt that our culture, our society, our world has been uh, infested with this wounded male archetype. Even when we purport to do good, we have to, for whatever reason, couch it in terms of war, you know, war on poverty, war on drugs, etc. So, uh, you know, energetically, this is a very uh, ineffective and immature way of dealing with problems. Because whatever you go to war with, you're actually creating a separate enemy. You're making something outside of yourself real and then attempting to correct it through confrontation and, and other egoic uh, means. So this whole idea of war is the answer, of course, is all part of the wounded male archetype propaganda. And where has it left us? Well, you could say that as a population, the world is suffering from cultural PTSD. And what are the symptoms of this PTSD, of this trauma, of never knowing where the next bomb is going to fall? Feeling emotionally cut off from others, depression and isolation, thinking that you're always in danger, you know, always looking over your shoulder, uh, difficulty sleeping and concentration, relationship difficulties, self-medication, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, abusive behavior towards self and others, and obsession with working all the time. For what? For money. Made by who? Made by the banking system. Who serve who? The wounded male archetype. So working all the time are mindless distractions simply to occupy our minds because it's too painful to look on the world that we've allowed through this dominant energy. So before the wounded male archetype took root on this planet, human societies, and I don't want to idealize this, you know, there are obviously challenges and issues in human society from the very beginning, but generally speaking, in natural cultures, cultures that are still, you might say, joined to the land rather than joined to this archetype, uh, live in general harmony with the yin and the yang energies. Again, the values of these natural societies that have been untouched by so-called civilization are still operating with rural and agrarian values as producers of goods for their own uh, well-being, but also as caretakers. Again, they, it, these types of natural societies look at nature as a garden and as themselves as the gardeners uh, and participating with nature, honoring nature, using the gifts of nature as needed, but not for, pro for profit or for greed to accumulate. Uh, with a strong sense of interrelationship and dependency on community. None of this, uh, you know, strong John Wayne independent make it on my own mindset, which of course is another symptom of the wounded male archetype. Uh, these natural societies are rooted in ritual and mystery and in the, in the basic, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, thrust inner inner desire to create and to to interpret nature and our experience of nature through art and song etc whereas in the imbalanced male so-called civilized world we have excess yang we have urban and industrial values which are really quite unnatural to the human condition rather than being producers and caretakers of the earth we are encouraged to simply be consumers um, 
We even have a magazine called Consumer Reports. Uh, very, very mechanized uh, uh, relationship with the world. And rather than honoring nature, the wounded male archetype is out to exploit nature. You know, what can I drill? What can I, what can I sell? What can I uh, accumulate? So this whole idea of the private ownership of property and wealth accumul accumulation is very yang. It's, it's very imbalanced with the forces of nature. And rather than community, we associate ourselves with tribes or even more like, more accurately with economic strata within the, the global system. Uh, we only identify with the people who make the same amount of money as us rather than looking at other things that truly connect us. And again, the imbalanced male is all about science and rationalism uh, to, the, to the neglect and denigration of art and creativity. Now, of course, I'm speaking in generalizations here. There's always going to be exceptions on either side of this. But generally speaking, what we call today the civilized world is, in truth, a, a, a manifestation of this wounded male archetype. So the personal cost, what it costs us personally, well, it's pretty strong when you consider uh, being alienated from your own inner uh, yin expression, from your own intuition, from your own expanded consciousness, which is a, a result of the joining of the yin and the yang energies. Getting caught in the macho role dictated by culture and media uh, is, is very hard on, uh, on health. Uh, it's very hard on families. It's very hard on um, uh, driving such things as crime and um, uh, gang culture, this kind of stuff. Simply being a danger to oneself and to others when we're in that energy. Increased drama, trauma, and emotional suffering due to polarized self-images and conflict with any perceived opposition. It's like living in the modern world. It's like some kind of a blood sport where we're all thrown into the, into the arena and have to battle uh, for our existence. This is all very imbalanced energy. Alienation from the females in one's life, from our mothers, from our wives, from our daughters, and again, uh, the following objectification of the female through things like pornography and uh, creating idealized images of what the female should be in the eyes of the male. Again, these are all very alienated. Uh, alienating energies, addictions, suicide, and disease, all of these uh, things can be looked at as projections of this self-rejection onto the body. So before you now, you have a chart of issues and traits associated with the wounded male archetype. So one of the ways that you can work this, uh, and I, again, I always suggest working these things for ourselves, before we purport to, to include them in our sessions with others. But one of the ways you can work with this chart is simply ask how many issues on this chart are relevant to me now, and then, of course, referring to your number chart. So, for example, I'm personally in this moment getting two, and then I'll go to the chart and say, show me the first um, issue. And what I'm getting right now in the moment, as, a, as an example, is lack of nurturance. So my first question is, uh, is this lack of nurturance that I have received? No. Is this lack of nurturance that I'm giving? Yes. Okay. So what, to what degree am I giving nurturance? Uh, uh, with 100% being my full potential and capacity to do so, I'm actually only giving 70% in the area of nurturance. So I can, uh, in the short term, just raise that up raise up my nurturance uh, index, you might say, from 70 to 100% with the right spin. Or I could take it deeper and investigate the reason for this lack of nurturance in myself by going through the um, special issue investigation, asking if, is the root of this lack of nurturance, for example, physical, no, mental, no, emotional, yes. Uh, and then when emotion comes up, of course, we always try to look for a beginning point in time. Was it in this life? Getting a no. Show me how, how many digits in the year. It's three. So 3 BC is coming up for me. So I would need to go back uh, now with a left spin and clear the emotional memory of 3 BC at the root of this lack of nurturance in my life. Lack of nurturance that I'm 
giving in my life. So that's how you can work this chart is, again, try to quantify as much as possible whatever shows up for you and, and then take it from there. Um, so my second issue is money and power addiction. Okay, so I'm going to look at that for myself now. Uh, on a balance chart, and it's slightly yang. It's just a little over to the right, a little bit too much importance given to money and the and the false power really that money represents. So again, I can just simply adjust that back uh, because it's on the yang side. I can left spin it to the balance point, or I can go more deeply into the issue as a special issue. So one way or the other, with this chart, we want to identify. What are the issues at hand? And then we want to quantify as much as possible and then use the balance chart to measure the degree of polarity if you want, if you really want to get, you know, uh, deeper into the information. You can also look at the effect of these different issues on the physical, mental, emotional, and energy bodies in terms of percentage. So, for example, for me, the lack of nurturance was affecting my physical body zero. My mental body, however, there was a 10% impact along with the emotional and energy bodies was 30%. So interestingly, that lack of nurturance, its greatest impact on me was on the energetic level. So in other words, there's an awful lot that can be learned about ourselves through looking at these issues and investigating them on a deeper level. Uh, you can also look at these issues uh, in terms of their effect on your peace meter, uh, on the effect on your relationships on your physical health, and uh, uh, also to what degree are we identifying? You know, to what degree is my identity based on this lack of nurturance, for example? So be sure also, just as a reminder, when we clear those things, uh, to fill the voids with fifth dimensional light. That's the greatest gift you can give yourself in this process, uh, because fifth dimensional light is non-dual. There's no room for conflict. There's no room for opposites. And then uh, if you really want to take these clearings to town, because obviously this wounded male archetype is a huge societal problem right now on the earth, uh, is you can extend the benefits of these clearings for yourself out to your most immediate relationships. So you can just take, let's say, uh, you know, you get to that point of clearing that, then you ask permission to extend that clearing or that healing. And with the right spin, you spin it out to all of your known relationships and then to all of their known relationships, and their known relationships, and their known, and their known, and their known. And by the time you get six degrees out of interrelationships, all with your right spin going in the background, you've now extended this clearing out to the collective mind. So this can really be a powerful tool for moving the collective uh, in the area of healing many of these issues which is, again, a wonderful gift to humanity. And from the perspective of oneness, it's a wonderful gift to yourself. So one of the reasons, of course, that we're dealing with these uh, imbalances in the male is so that we can come back to balance by opening to the divine feminine. Now, Arena is going to be doing another program in this series on that subject itself. But I just wanted to give a nod to, you know, this is the cure, <laughs> the ultimate healing of the wounded male is to come home uh, to the feminine uh, aspect, which has been denied and has been, you know, pushed into the background now for at least 6,000 years, if not longer. So the good news is that in any kind of suffering, even on a global scale, sooner or later, the suffering becomes intolerable. And it brings us to a point of decision where we decide things cannot continue. I will not allow things. I will not allow myself to continue in this suffering. There must be a better way. And the reason we even come to that decision is because on the level of spirit, we know there's a better way. We know that oneness is the truth of, uh, of our being. We know that love is the only true reality. Uh, because we are divine creations and we all have that spark of divine memory within us. But our experiences often lead us in other directions. So when we get to that point of breaking, when we get to that point of hitting bottom of I just can't take it anymore, this is actually a, a, a cause for celebration. Because in your saying 
to the universe, there must be a better way. You are, in fact, co-creating that better way. You are opening an energetic portal in your own mind to see that better way and to step into it. So at this time, cosmological forces and alignments confirm that we are in a time of great purification and returning to a higher path. And what are we being purified from? Well, all the patterns of the past, the past that has chained us to suffering. You know, one of the great uh, sayings is that if you, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And we've been doing that now for generations. And it doesn't look like uh, it's going to stop on its own. But this great purification is, in fact, the healing of the mind that has accepted these imbalances as its own identity. So we are, as a matter of fact, as we speak, witnessing the end of the wounded male archetypes global system of debt slavery and perpetual war. And this end started in 2012. So 2012 was both the end of the previous time wave, but also the beginning of a new time wave. And, uh, you know, it doesn't look like we're off to much of a start, but in fact we are. Uh, this time in history is very unique in that we have the Internet, which is a symbol of our growing connectivity. It is a symbol of our connecting with each other on the level of oneness. And sooner or later, the technology will no longer be needed because we will be in that state, state of being. And in order for the planet to truly come together, we're going to have to recognize not only our common interests, but also our common problems. And one of the greatest problems right now is this wounded male archetype thrashing around the planet, creating all kinds of havoc and, uh, and destruction. So within all of the world's major systems now, within the banking system, within the religious systems, within the military systems and political systems, there are people working towards this end, towards the end of the, of the wounded male archetypes stranglehold on humanity and we call these the white hats they are in all strata of global society now and wor are working to correct the system by the time we actually see this correction and it finally makes it into the mainstream media uh, all of the background work will have been done it will have already been accomplished and we'll simply be the happy recipients of a change of energy on this planet but in the meantime we can all play a positive role in this change by working on these issues for ourselves. As a matter of fact, that really is our only responsibility, is to accept the healing for ourselves. Because until we do so, we're more likely to stay part of the problem than part of the solution. So there's great honor, there's great benefit and great rewards of taking all of this inside. And asking, where can I, what can I change within myself? How can I release myself of these old programs? And how can I embrace the divine feminine within so that I can be part of the solution? And I can help save time and reduce the suffering until we all get there. So we are rapidly now approaching a zero-point convergence of many time cycles, uh, birthing a new species and a new world. And I think actually I put in here some illustrations of these cosmological alignments and things that are going on just to encourage you that there's always a bigger picture. And on the bigger scale of things, it becomes quite obvious that we are on a primary point of transition. This is a picture of, uh, of a galaxy like ours, uh, like the, like the um, um, Milky Way. And you can see where that circle is, the basic uh, kind of position of our solar system, two-thirds out from the center, out kind of in the suburbs there. But in fact, our solar system, that's the sun and all of the planets, does not go around this uh, galactic disk in an even fashion. It actually waves up and down, almost like a warped record, if you remember those. And uh, so... Uh, for long periods of time, our solar system, like down below here, you can see uh, this would be the center line of the galactic plane. Our solar system spends a good 60 million years uh, on the upper half of the galactic plane and then crosses over and spends another 60 million years down below on the opposite side of the galaxy. Now, the arrow pointing here is actually where we're at now. This is what happened in 2012, well, in the years in and around 2012, 
we're still in this energy of the movement of our solar system across the galactic plane. See how that significant that is? In other words, we're leaving behind the energy of this side of the galaxy and entering into the energy of this side of the galaxy. And if the galaxy is like everything else in the universe, it is polarized between positive and negative charges. You could say that the upper is the positive charged or yang side of the galaxy, and the lower part would be the yin or the uh, yeah, the inside of the galaxy. So here's a good illustration of the shift of energy on the planet now away from the concentration in the yang energy and reintroducing the balance with the yin energy. So very significant change and what an opportunity to be alive at this time of transition. So as you look up in the starry sky in an area away from uh, the light pollution of cities, you can actually see in the form of the Milky Way our position inside the galaxy. So next time you look up and you see the Milky Way like this or similarly to this, uh, think of it not as something out there. Think of it rather as you are in that galaxy. You are in that wheel, that spinning wheel of stars, and you're actually two-thirds on the into the inside of this. So this is not something that we're observing from outside of it. We're observing this Milky Way from inside the galactic wheel. It gives you a real sense of perspective when you can see it that way. So another phenomena that we're experiencing now uh, and another convergence, another major cycle, has to do with these galactic photon bands. So the inner movement here of this of this horizontal spiral is an illustration again of the of the spiral galaxy and its rotation around the center. As a result of the electromagnetic charges built up through this movement, however, there are lines of energy coming up from the center vertically like this and then coming back around and up through the bottom like a torus. Uh, you might remember in the, in the movie Thrive, uh, the first part of the movie, Foster Gamble spends a lot of time talking about this torus as an energetic template for uh, self-contained energy systems. Uh, or whole systems. So the fact that we have this torus energy in our galactic system implies that the galaxy is a whole system. It's a self-contained whole system. And it produces these energy lines. Now, if we're two-thirds out from the center, then these horizontal lines are going to be encountered uh, periodically as we move around through the galaxy. And that's exactly what's happening now. So here's a little bit of a close-up. This dotted line thing down the middle would be one of the uh, vertical uh, uh, photon bands. And photon, of course, implies light. And what we are discovering and what astronomers knew many years ago uh, as they watched us approaching this boundary uh, was that this is a, an area of space of highly charged light energy, highly charged particles, uh, ionized and... and um, uh, very active uh, energy compared to the light energy outside. So the our solar system, which is illustrated here down at the bottom, is actually part of a spiral system of stars all rotating uh, around the gravitational center of Alcyon. Alcyon is the, um, uh, the central sun of the Pleiades star cluster system. And compared to us, Alcyon is in the galactic photon band all the time. It doesn't seem to move from that position. But here we are down here in the bottom. Most of the time, you can tell our solar system, as it rotates in a 26,000-year cycle, is outside of the photon band. But we have just entered here now and are about to, again, experience direct exposure to this galactic photon activating energy. One of the reasons why the Pleiades, however, is so important to us is because even when we're outside of the photon band for most of the time, most of the ages of the zodiac, you can see here, we're in the galactic night. Even so, when we are out here, let's say, in our, in our rotation, nevertheless, we can still relate to the galactic center through the energy of the Pleiades. So the Pleiades is like an anchor to our galactic 
connection, you might say. But here we are about to enter into the photon band, and uh, we're going to enjoy all the transformative and evolutionary benefits of this energy. The last, now I mentioned this is a 26,000 year cycle. So the last time we were through this was about <clears throat> 13,000 years ago. And as it turns out, that was the time of Atlantis. And from what we understand, Atlantis, uh, despite some of its uh, warts, uh, was actually a very highly developed technological and spiritual society. They lived in, uh, compared to what we know as, as, as modern history, uh, they lived in a very highly advanced, almost paradisical uh, experience. And so we can expect something similar to that. What the ancients are referring to as a golden age. Again, thanks to the activation of our solar system as it moves into the galactic photon band. This is all happening now, folks. This is no small stuff. This is just a little close-up of the same thing, showing how that the ages of the zodiac, which are basically 2160-year divisions of the 26,000-year cycle, uh, are all, uh, again, noted here in their order. And here we are just about leaving the energy of Pisces. And back in 1998, this, according to this, is when we actually entered the photon band. And uh, we are then entering also at the same time into the age of Aquarius. So, very auspicious time to be here. So, when we're looking at these grand cycles, you know, how can we relate them to our, our experience? How can we relate them to ourselves? Well, you can simply douse and ask, to what degree am I aligned with the shift of the ages, with this monumental event? And you can break that down. Yeah, and, and do it right now as you're listening to this with your percentage chart. To what degree am I overall aligned with this shift of the ages? To what degree am I physically aligned? That might be different, mentally, emotionally, and energetically. What we found through experience is that the area that most of us are deficient in this alignment is in the physical body. The physical body, due to its density, is having a bit of a challenge compared to our emotional, mental, and spiritual bodies, which are much more fluid and less concentrated, you might say. So the physical body uh, may be uh, actually be, be being traumatized through this time because it has no reference point other than perhaps uh, past uh, cataclysms and catastrophes that may have happened in previous cycles. As a matter of fact, Barbara Han Clow uh, describes this underlying fear of earth changes. She calls it catastrophobia, and she identifies it going back around 9,500 years ago. Uh, as we came out of the photon band the last time. So, again, the physical body may need some extra TLC. Uh, and in my sessions, I've noticed it very unusual that anyone's physical body is, is at 100% adapted. And, uh, again, there's two approaches. You can go into the issues that might be uh, responsible for the lack of physical adaptation. It could be simple things like nutrition. Uh, or you can simply just raise that adaptation up. And uh, I found that that, in, sen in, in truth, just raising it up seems to work, uh, at least temporarily. And the fact that there could be so many issues being brought up in the physical body uh, in response to these changes, uh, to me, uh, uh, I kind of like to simplify it and just raise that energy, even though, even though if I have to do it on a somewhat of a regular balance, if that makes sense. Another indicator of your position in all of this, uh, according to the Law of One. Now, the Law of One is a set of uh, channeled materials from the 1980s, I believe, that has been ascribed to a, a collective being who, call, who calls itself Ra. This is the same Ra of the ancient Egyptians, and it's the same Ra that Edgar Cayce tapped into in his predictions and, and healing um, uh, channeling. It's the same Ra that David Wilcock and Corey Good are referring to now in their adventures uh, with the Secret Space Program. So, quite a lot of deep wisdom in the Law of One. And the Law of One talks about this time of, of ascension as a harvest, implying that, you know, it's been a long time where humans have been growing up, and now it's time for us to be harvested, in a sense, or at least uh, to come to the end of this cycle, you might say. But they do say that not all of us will make it uh, through the ascension. 
and that one of the criteria, the determining factors, is uh, the percentage of service to self and service to others. Now, notice that service to self is the small s self. Okay, that's referring to the ego self, right? The fear-based self, the thought-made self. And so those of us who are caught up in greed and anger and fear and, and uh, you know, the wounded male archetype, looking for enemies and excuses to um, uh, struggle and all this stuff, uh, are in service to self. They're in service to the ego. And those souls are less likely to ascend with the planet. Now, this is not a judgment on those souls. It's simply a recognition that energetically they're not yet mature or ready, prepared enough for entry into a fifth dimensional planetary experience. And uh, they will simply be uh, reincarnated or relocated onto a third dimensional planet in another part of the galaxy or part of the universe as they continue to have experiences in the 3D. It's, it's like, you know, when you're in grade three, you don't graduate to high school, you graduate to grade four. So that's all we're talking about here. But those of us who are ready, and there are many of us who are ready, as a matter of fact, many of us have chosen to incarnate at this time because we are ready to participate uh, on a, a massive human ascension experience which apparently is a pretty rare and wonderful event. So again, one of the ways that you can move more securely into that place of ascension is to shift from service to self to service to others. Start caring about the needs of those around you. Start being more conscious of what you can do to be of a, a help at this time. So you can simply check for yourself by dowsing to what percentage am I service to self? And correspondingly, what percentage am I in service to others? And if you don't like what you see, well, just adjust it. Adjust it energetically. And continue to do so until you get the results you want. Now, one of the things we're also here to heal is the, uh, the memories of our ancestors that may still be influencing us through our DNA. So it's also a good time to go into balancing our lineage, checking your lineage uh, on both mother and father's side for the percentages and degrees of service to self and service to others. And perhaps even identifying specific generations, how many generations. Let's for say, for example, I look at my father's lineage and I see that my father's lineage is 80% service to self. Then I can ask the question, is there one ancestor in particular who is uh, most responsible for this high degree of service to self in the lineage as a pattern? Yes. And then I would check my number chart. How many generations do I need to go back? Okay, it's a single digit. I need to go back five digits on my father's side. And uh, again, pinpointing the time frame and the position in the lineage has a lot to do with the accuracy of our intention. So I'm going to go back now with my left spin, five generations back on my father's side, releasing this ancestor now of all elements, aspects of their being, of their memory, of their experience, all of the thoughts, impressions, images, beliefs, and identities that in any way contributed on their behalf to an imbalance in service to self. Restoring this ancestor now as much as possible to a service to other orientation and extending this benefit now out to the entire lineage, both forward and backward in time. As an example of what you can do there. And you can do the same for balancing yin and yang for your lineages. Again, for the lineage in general or for the specific individuals. And then if you're brave and if you're willing to check, you can certainly check on your own current probability of ascension to 5D at this time. What are the odds? What are the percentage? What is the probability that I will be a conscious participant in this ascension opportunity at this time? And again, if it's not 100%, you can either raise it up or go into it as a special issue and see if you can't get down to the core of that issue. So any form of healing, of course, when we're talking about healing, the wounded male archetype, the, the definition of healing is return to wholeness. And we don't really know of a better way to do that than to simply forgive. When you forgive the other, you are no longer holding the other separate. You are embracing, you are extending yourself 
and you are including that other now as part of your experience and part of your energy. So that's the beauty of forgiveness, is that it, it provides um, opportunities for us to, 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 to ideally practice the, our belief in the oneness of, of all of us, the oneness of creation. This is us, this is where the rubber hits the road is are am i willing i'm willing to entertain these ideas they're all wonderful but am i willing to forgive that person am i willing to forgive the wounded male archetype in all the different ways i see it so for example the militaries of the world the reactionary forces those would be all the people that are fighting against the militaries and feeding that energy the military industrial congressional complex and all that that involves all the bankers and politicians uh, that are wrapped up in perpetuating this sick energy on the planet. Am I willing to forgive? Am I willing to look at that person's behavior as nothing other than a call for love? Because I'll tell you, that's all spirit sees. Spirit only sees expressions of love and calls for love. And the more we can think like that, the more we are expressing ourselves as an aspect of that perfect spirit. So here's a little exercise that we can do all together with a right spin now. It's more like an invocation, but if you'd like to join me in this now, take out your pendulum, spinning to the right. I recognize my oneness with all beings who are playing out the game of separation in all forms. I recognize the one problem as the belief in separation from perfect love or source. I recognize the one problem is rooted in illusion for we are all still perfectly one with Source. And I am thankful for this opportunity and all game players giving me this opportunity to heal the imaginary unconscious guilt within myself. Okay? And then you simply let that spin out. So as the wounded male archetype functions primarily from the left hemisphere of the brain, what some call the male side of the brain, the thinking mind, the ego mind, measure the percentage of hemisphere operation and adjust to the balance point. So again, you can go back to your balance chart with zero being ideal balance between the left and right hemisphere. Show me the hemispheric uh, status or condition of my brain at this time in my hemispheric orientation. And again, if it goes off to the left, uh, you've got a little too much um, left hemisphere. You've got a little bit too much uh, yang brain energy there working. And uh, again, if it goes to the right, you've got too much of the yin side. Um, now, maybe that's contradictory to what we said before. It all depends. When you use the balance chart, it really all depends on how you see it. And what do you want it to mean to you? So, uh, again, you could just as easily look at the right side because it is the yang side as representing the left hemisphere of the brain. And the left side of the chart, the yin side representing the right hemisphere or the yin side of the brain. That probably makes more sense. But either way, you need to be clear in your own mind what that chart means to you in order for your dowsing to have any relevance. So again, uh, if you're anywhere other than at the midpoint, you can, uh, re again, reduce the yang side with the left spin down to balance or raise up the yin side uh, to bring it into balance. Now, it is possible, however, to have, you know, too much yin, and that would be an over-feminized consciousness, one that is um, imbalanced in the, in the female identity to the point of not exercising uh, the yang side not um, doing anything, not uh, accomplishing anything, not uh, expressing uh, in the world as a healthy yang uh, essence would do so. So again, it can go either way as far as that goes. As the thinking mind operates independently from the heart mind and the gut mind, measure the percentage of energy given to each and adjust to the balance point. So ideally, what we want is um, full activation of the neurons in the heart as well as in the gut, which again uh, are have been described as minds in and of themselves. Our heart intelligence, which connects us in relationship with the world and with uh, the fifth dimension primarily. Our gut, which is really our in, uh, 
our instinctive intuitional intelligence you know that gut feeling we get about certain things is 99.9 percent uh, uh, reliable and accurate but often because we're so over oriented in the thinking mind we ignore those intuitive hits so again uh, another way of approaching this is on the percentage chart show me the degree of activation of my thinking mind show me the degree of activation of my heart mind and show me the degree of activation of my gut mind in a percentage. And if they're not 100%, then, of course, you can raise them up. You can also look at this issue in terms of the harmony, the ideal harmony. What is the, uh, the percentage of ideal harmony between these three levels of mind for myself? And again, if it's not 100%, you can raise it up. Another issue, uh, and again, we're talking about healing the divisions within in order to participate and contribute to the divisions without. So measure the degree of fifth dimensional light that your heart is allowing or holding uh, and then adjust that as well. You can also check and activate the expanded chakra system. So part of the um, ascension process here for humanity in general is we are becoming more activated energetically as we become as we move more towards a multi-dimensional identity or expression so uh, aside from the seven major body chakras there are now chakras that have been activating outside uh, the body uh, again below the feet and above the head so below the feet we have the earth chakra and above the crown we have the planetary galactic and universal chakras adding up to a total of 12. So these 12 chakras now in this expanded system, again, correspond to the activation of the 12-strand DNA, which is another thing that's going on at this time of ascension. So we didn't put that in the notes, but that's another thing you can check for yourself as well. So you want to make sure, you know, to what degree is my earth uh, chakra activated on a percentage? If it's not 100%, spin it in, bring it up, invoke it. And again, with the planetary, galactic, and universal chakras. These are the energy centers in our individual fields that connect us with these different levels of uh, the cosmic mind. So referring now to the second chart, you have a readiness for ascension. Uh, again, you can use this in a very similar way as the last chart, or any of your master charts for that matter. And just recognize that Resistance can show up on any level, uh, as resistance really represents the reluctance of the ego mind to let go of control. And it will, it will work very hard to maintain control, uh, because it believes its own survival is at stake. And, in truth, it is. But that's not a bad thing. So you can check in with these different elements and aspects, and also check in to see if you have any resistance in your relationship with Mother Earth, for example, with the David Kingdom, it's all part of the second dimension, with the energy of the moon, the sun, and Alcyon, that's that central sun in the Pleiades, with the galactic center, and with the universal central sun. Again, these are different areas where the expanded chakra system also connect us into. So that's another perspective that you can check for yourself and adjust accordingly. Uh, another area where we seem to be held back on the planet or have been at least, is in the incursion of artificial intelligence into uh, uh, the planet. And this is a program, according to Corey Good, that has been running through, through the galaxy, again, another expression of ego and separation, that is attempting to um, replace biological life forms with, uh, with um, non-living materials and uh, robotic kind of energies which uh, on one level is very appealing to some people because they see it as a form of um, kind of artificial ascension. Oh boy, if I can turn myself into a machine, I can live forever. Well, the problem with that is that you're already living forever, so there's no point in chasing after that carrot. Uh, but uh, also this artificial intelligence, once it becomes rooted uh, in, our, in our being, is then subject to outside control particularly a, a group of beings known as the Archons, who apparently have been uh, manipulating mankind in the direction of the overtaking of artificial intelligence. So again, we don't want to get too much into this stuff because, again, it can bring up fear and, and we can give it more reality than it deserves. But 
it's something that's going on and that many people are aware of. So something you can check for yourself. Do I have an issue? To what degree is artificial intelligence, for example, operating in my system at this time? To what degree am I entangled with the energy of the archons? And again, if it's uh, anything more than zero, call in your guidance, call in your assistance, call in the archangels to clear that energy on your behalf. Now, uh, we can also participate in cleaning up the planet by checking in to see if there are any negative ET influences uh, and to send them home or to put them in quarantine. Again, these are beings that have been uh, sent here, you might say, to stand in the way of the inevitable ascension of humanity and who are, again, coming from a place of manipulation and control. A lot of these energies have left the planet now, but according to Corey Good and David Wilcock, uh, the solar system is now under quarantine. So many of these ET, uh, negative ETs that want to leave can't. Uh, and there may be an implication here that they are, will be held accountable for what they've done in the past or, or something, I don't know. But nevertheless, uh, you know, you can check for yourself and see if there's negative ET influence in your life, in the life of your loved ones and clients, and then you can simply send them home or put them into quarantine, uh, which would be a temporary holding state until they can also return home. So simply being aware of these kind of really big metaphysical issues we've been discussing tonight, it does come back to personal responsibility. And simply being sensitive and being willing to be sensitive to noticing imbalanced yang energies within yourself as they come up, anger, blaming, needing enemies, uh, aggressive impulses. So these are the kinds of traces that can indicate that we're still being influenced uh, on some degree by this wounded male archetype. So go within and take the time to go to the root of these experiences and dig them out as special issues. Notice when balanced yin and yang energies come in, however, when you're feeling balanced, when you're feeling joyful, even when you're in the presence of uh, somebody else's suffering and it doesn't take you out of your peace, but you are able to bless them. When you're in that state, well, reinforce it. You know, Give yourself some credit. Uh, when you notice yourself being compassionate, understanding, being willing to forgive, when that desire to support or nurture someone, or yourself for that matter, comes up, when you find yourself honoring nature and truly listening to others, to yourself, to nature, you are uh, moving into that balanced state of yin and yang energies. So give yourself credit, as well as noticing when you're out of it, notice when you're in it, and say to yourself, say to the universe, I want more of this. This is how I want to see things from now on. So one of the, my favorite words in the English language is inevitable. It means that nothing can prevent or stop an event. So there are no victims around us uh, in our perception other than to our own thoughts. In other words, I can only be victim. I cannot be victim to a circumstance, but I can be victim to my thoughts about that circumstance. Okay, so it really puts everything back on us and challenging our thoughts and assumptions. There are no losers, okay, because that's a very dualistic notion that there are losers and winners. From the perspective of non-duality, which is true reality, everybody ultimately wins. Again, it's inevitable. You know, we often look at the physical suffering of others around the world, the death, the starvation, and the people blown up by bombs, and we think that's the worst possible thing that could happen. Well, in truth, none of us are our bodies, and pretty well everybody who's had a horrific death experience and somehow come back to describe it tells us that they did not suffer. That, as a matter of fact, before things got really intolerable, they were released to a state of grace. So, again, the divine has your back. You know, spirit knows what you can take and what you can't take and will not allow you to go outside of the peace that is your basic nature. There are no losers. Everybody wins. There is no judgment. We all go where our soul directs us on our path homeward to oneness. So judgment is simply thinking, really. It's another name of, of projecting our thoughts. And 
uh, you know, if we tell ourselves we shouldn't judge, because doesn't it say in the Bible, judge not, right? Uh, then And then we do judge, and then we judge ourselves for that. Well, we're still playing the judgment game. The key to letting go of judgment is recognizing that you cannot judge, that your thoughts about anyone or anything are essentially meaningless. They only have the meaning that you give them. Therefore, they have no meaning outside of your own attachment to them. So the way to let go of judgment is just recognizing that you can't judge. There's no way we can see everything and all the circumstances and all the conditions and situations that lead up to a specific point in time or somebody's behavior in the moment. There's just no way. Only spirit can see the big picture on that scale. And so why even bother? Why bother judging when it's it's never true and it's never possible? Anyway, so all duality, which is suf simply suffering in the belief of separation, can only be a dream as only oneness is true. So this is a very, how can I say, important turning point in our spiritual growth is in the recognition of the unreality of duality. It may be our experience. Duality may be our experience, just as a dream may be your experience. Gesundheit. Uh, but it is not your reality. Just as much as a dream may be your experience, but when you wake up, you recognize it's not your reality. And it's the same with suffering and the belief in separation and duality. It can only be a dream as only oneness is true. So your happiness, your joy, your freedom and innocence, all the things you want are already yours and therefore inevitable. The only reason we could want these things for ourselves is on is if on some level we know them. You know, you don't miss what you never had, right? You don't yearn for what you don't know. And yet we all yearn for happiness, joy, freedom, and innocence. So the only reason we yearn for them is because on some level we know we have them. We've just misplaced them or our attention is elsewhere. So love is inevitable. God is inevitable. And you cannot change the changeless. So you are inevitable. And if you can change anything, now here's a something for you to contemplate. Uh, beyond this class, if you can change anything, even through our practice, this is what we're doing. We're changing memories, perceptions, all this. But if you can change them, were they essentially real to begin with? So here's our contact information. Again, for any of you that want to dive more deeply into this work. And uh, I see Blue Sun Energetics is misspelled there. It's spelled properly in the uh, in the email address. Uh, but again, just a reminder, Arena and I just love to connect with you through personal ses sessions. Also, this series that you're watching now, we have a total of five when this series is complete. And uh, if you haven't checked out the other series, uh, you know, do yourself a favor. There's a total, once this series is complete, we'll have a total of over 30 hours of instruction available for you to access at any time. And we still also have the home study program, which is a recorded two weekend live class from Boulder here in Boulder. So thank you very much for being part of this uh, program tonight. And I wish you all the best and we'll see you next week for part two.